I've got 29, five seconds, four, three, two. Okay. <clears throat> Recording in progress. Kohontin 如何了生不死 great virtue Out of compassion For the sake of this assembly And all living beings Please turn the wonderful Dharma will to teach us how to live suffering and attend please and end person death and quickly realize number. Namu Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Harahadoi Sama Sambuddhasa. Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo Sadanto Suchedoye Allahudi Samyao Sambuddhoshe. Namo Sadanto Suche Doye Lahudi Samyao Samputo Shi Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Sao Yu Wo Jin Jen Wan De Shou Chi Yan Jie Ru Lai Jen Shi Yi Supreme and Wondrous Dharma Subtle and Profound Rarely is encountered even in billions of eons But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shifu Shangren, Gowei Shishung, Daja Omi Tofo, Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Reverend Hung Shur. It's Sunday, October 29th. Um, I am here, it's, that's here in Gold Coast of Australia. It's Saturday, October 28th, back in California. And we're going to be exploring the Flower Garland Sutra, the Hua Yin Jing. Welcome and glad that you're here. Looking forward to what we're going to encounter today in our text. Something quite wonderful is, is about to be investigated. So let us continue with our... There we go. Continue with our preliminaries to getting the lecture underway. We can invoke spiritual presence with a bit of melody. Oh, 
Furthermore, we respectfully acknowledge the Kumbumere people of the Ugambe language region as traditional storytellers and custodians of the land where our monastery is located. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging and to all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. I don't know why that's so hard to say. Uh, last version, uh, our older translation was much easier. Uh, that I have a hard time with that one. We will skip by the Pomo people and we'll skip by the Ohlone people and go right to our bell song. There we are. Bell sound wide resounds throughout a hundred million worlds. The Buddha's law is heard and spread all throughout the triple world. The wondrous sounds that everywhere fill the Dharma realm with peace. May those who hear it gain the strength to follow in faith the Buddha's path. Zhong Shang Chuan San Tian Jian Ei Fo Fa Yang Wan Yi Guo Zhong Gong Xun Qi Fa Jie He Ping Li Yi Bao Tan Wa Hou De So that's for people whose voices are bell-like, like the Buddha. Okay, um, what we got today, remind people where we are. And before we launch into it, let me say how much I appreciate all the help in bringing this lecture series to the world through Zoom, through YouTube, through various internet channels. It takes a lot of hands and hearts and breath and focus and attention, consciousness to brought together to allow us to investigate the Flower Garland Sutra and also to do so in, uh, I get to speak English because we have a team of dedicated translators who are tireless in taking my words in English and translating them into modern Mandarin, as well as Vietnamese, so that people who would prefer to hear the Dharma in Vietnamese can uh, find the Avatamsaka Sutra's teaching. So. Um, most grateful for all that effort. On top of that, there are folks who take the time regularly to uh, organize all of the protocols for live streaming, recording, and sending out the, the Dharma to the world. So without uh, any single piece of that interlocking Rubik's Cube, this lecture would be very, very different. Uh, I'm here in the uh, broadcast towers of the Paramita House, which is nothing more than my desk, but I have a beautiful Guanyin image. And uh, I also want to share, I also have an amazing Sarasvati Devi image here. Let's see if I can get it straight. There we go. Sarasvati is the the goddess of eloquence and her energy. Notice she says, Sarasvati Devi Namaha. So uh, I dedicate my attention to her uh, before every lecture as well. Um, this is how Ashurfu instructed his disciples to prepare for lectures if you really want to make the, the sutra, the minds of the viewers and listeners, 
and whatever uh, samadhi or skill the lecturer brings, those three come together with the aid of the bodhisattvas, the avatamsaka assembly, and the goddess of eloquence to uh, make this experience something pure, ideally. Pure not to say clean, yeah, hopefully clean, but free from the distraction of ordinary stuff like emotion, like compassion fatigue, like frustration, like political confusion and turmoil, along with the standard greed, anger, delusion, pride, and doubt that, that are part of every living being, part of all of us. So with all those pieces together, uh, we can get the lecture down the road, moving along, firing on all cylinders. So if you've got an electric vehicle firing with every battery, I don't know, how do we quantify? We used to say uh, a V8, you know, uh, what would we say? Uh, how fast in, you know, zero to 60 in four seconds, moving down the road. Um, now we've got electric vehicles. So we have to figure some way to quantify meaning at top speed, performing optimally. Yeah, so Scotty can say, <laughs> Captain Kirk can say, Scotty, give me more power. And Scotty says, I'm giving her all she's got, Captain. Random Star Trek references. Here we go. What's going on today? Our bodhisattvas are in the Jada Grove waiting for the Buddha to speak Dharma. And we're almost there. Um, the preliminaries are almost over. We've been at this now for months. Uh, when we began the chapter 39, the Ru Fa Jiapin, the chapter called Merging with the Dharma Realm, Entering the Dharma Realm, we, um, of course, know about Sudhana's pilgrimage. He is the one who appears. And it's fascinating because Sudhana, Shansai Tongzi, he is the um, he is the protagonist. He is the the Zhu Jiao. Is that what you call him? He is the 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 hero who emerges at the very end of the Avatamsaka Sutra and turns the sutra, which has been uh, an exposition of the Bodhisattva path explaining the Bodhisattva path, more or less theoretically, in theory, uh, of how it should be done with all the different 10,000 practices. Liu, Du, Wan, Hung, all the different ways that Bodhisattvas practice, in theory, how it should be done. And now we get a recognizable individual, somebody with a name and a history and a backstory who comes forward and sets out on the path, takes those principles in theory and puts them into practice. Oh my goodness, it's exciting to have Sudhana come forward and get uh, initiated, get set on his, get, get his, his instructions from whom? From no less a figure than Manjushri Bodhisattva. And uh, in today and tomorrow, uh, I guess actually tomorrow, but not tomorrow, next to this week and next week, we're going to meet Manjushri and uh, find out what it's like when he shows up. Um, so we're just before that section. And as we've said since we've started, let's get through the preliminaries to get to, quote, the good part when Sudhana shows up. Of course, it's all good. But um, we're almost at the end of that process. And as I've said multiple times, the Buddha announces he's going to speak. He, the light comes out, the bodhisattvas get the, get the word, get the message. They start showing up from all 10 directions, north, south, east, west, intermediate, above and below. They all arrive at the Jada Grove. And the Buddha is there, and the Jada Grove expands to accommodate all of these bodhisattvas with their gatherings, with their their homies and their retinue 
who come together. And the bodhisattvas make offerings one by one. They appear in front of the Buddha. They praise in a, with a variety of voices and topics and, and uh, meters. They, they sing different melodies, different beats. The bump, 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 bump. They say what they want to say about the Dharma, about wisdom, about skill and means, about psychic powers. They praise all these different things. It's more than just, oh, Buddha is great. They say that too, but they, they really, uh, the, the variety of the praises is just remarkable. That was my big discovery as I was exploring these, is how when bodhisattvas decide they're going to sing the praises of, uh, of the Buddha, the, the things they come up with to praise are just remarkable. So they do that. They all sit back down. Then uh, the Buddha releases light. And from that light, um, psychic dis displays of psychic abilities appear. That's not psychic abilities. We don't, there was a, uh, this amazing book in the 50s and 60s, Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. Any boomers old enough to remember that? And that was Yuri Geller, Bending Spoons, and Kirlian Photography, all these things. And it's amazing that actually the United States Department of Defense started to uh, investigate in the psychic community. They would go and interview Madame Olga uh, and uh, the great Rinaldo to see if we could find somebody who knew what the, the Russians were discovering because they can't they can't beat us into space although they did Sputnik uh, and they can't beat us to psychic discoveries so anyway that's a story for another time but um, these the the light that the Buddha releases shows all these incredible uh, true and real phenomena that science can't explain. Because you can't measure it without seeing it. And you can't see it unless your wisdom vision is clear. And when your eyes are clear, you can see forever. Father Cyprian Concilio has a song that goes, you can see forever when your vision is clear. Um, he gives thanks for awakening in his song, Father Cyprian's beautiful song called Awakening. So without clear eyes, you can't see any of this. And that's proven because I, I skipped one episode in this preliminary, which is when uh, the group that was attending failed to see what was going on because they mostly, their minds were limited to by, you can't say selfishness, by comparison with bodhisattvas, they're selfish. But uh, compared with the rest of us, these, the, the cultivators, the arhats and pracheka buddhas in the Jada Grove were incredible, outstanding, remarkable human beings. But uh, they, by comparison with bodhisattvas, they couldn't see. So the sutra makes that point. Um, meanwhile, um, what happens next? The light comes out, the psychic displays are incredible wonders, marvelous things are seen. And Manjushri, bodhisattva, pays attention and decides he's going to praise the bodhisattvas gathered here who are waiting. He goes around and he talks about what they can do, how incredible they are. And uh, the Buddha enters Samadhi, and it's the lion sprint, the lion's invigoration, I think we decided, of uh, Samadhi. And in that Samadhi, oh my goodness, um, all of the other bodhisattvas gathered around the Buddha in the, in the assembly. Everyone in the audience enters the Samadhi as well. And the Buddha once more praises the bodhisattvas. And where we are now, um, the last week uh, we heard about the skillful ways 
that bodhisattvas teach, how good they are at responding to people's needs, to people's abilities, to people's uh, potential for awakening, and they go right to that potential and help them wake up. They develop your best talents and help you suppress your worst bad habits so that bit by bit the Bodhi resolve is born and comes to fruition. So that's where we are. And uh, last week we had the paramitas. Bodhisattvas use, there's an Abhatamsaka number, an infinite number. They use these uh, methods for crossing over. Paramitas means ways across, how you cross over from samsara, birth and death, endless cycle, across the stream of afflictions, troubles, blues, doubts, um, excessive exposure to cell phones, which kind of hook us on stimulation, cell phone uh, neurosis, cell phone disease is, is now getting lots of attention these days. We just don't, we're apparently uh, children are coming up nearsighted these days because staring into your phone for hours and hours uh, gives you nearsightedness, changes the shape of your eyeball. So the, uh, across that, that stream of affliction to the other shore of nirvana, which is the ending of the constant coming, going, coming, going, coming, going, coming, going. So the, uh, those are paramitas. We heard about um, six of them, and we're going to pick up right at that spot. Here we go. Here it is. That's where we finished last week. Let's boost this up. Okay, skill and means, skillful expedient techniques. Oh, we don't want to do that. The way bodhisattvas teach us. We'll read to the end of the page and then come back and pick up the English. Here we go. Huo xian bu ke shuo fu cha wei chen shu xiang fu zhong mo zhi zhu wai dao xian pu sa fu zhi li men. Huo xian bu ke shuo fu cha wei chen shu zhi yi qie gong qiao ming zhi men. Huo xian bu ke shuo fu cha wei chen shu zhi yi qie zhong sheng zhi bie ming zhi men. 或现不可说佛刹微尘树知一切法区别明智门或现不可说佛刹微尘树知一切众生心要区别明智门或现不可说佛刹微尘树知一切众生根恨烦恼习气明智门或现不可说佛刹微尘树知一切众生种种业明智门或现不可说佛刹微尘树开悟一切众生们。Alrighty, let's dig into it. Here we go. At times they use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras to show how to tame the demonic hordes, subdue their heterodox ways, and reveal the bodhisattva's blessings, wisdom, and powers. Okay, I'm going to do the English one by one. We did the Chinese all together. I'll just uh, finish with one, read it, finish with it, move on, okay? We, um, we're going to skim quickly through the... the, the the, pre, the preamble, but this is so rich that I would like to slow down here and uh, go use the standard technique, which is to uh, exhaust the, um, uh, explain the technical terms, explain the, uh, the, the language, see what it says, and then see if we know what it means. That's the standard way, right? We'll do that. Bodhisattvas at times used methods equal in number two, dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras. We've said it. That's the 
boilerplate that repeats in each of these 25 kinds of expedient means. So how many is dust particles in an effable Buddhakshetras? How many are there? Lots of zeros, many. Bodhisattvas in life after life where they appear coming to teach use that many methods to show how to, okay? And then the, from this part on is the, the different method. All right, what is it? Taming demonic hordes, subduing heterodox ways, revealing the bodhisattvas, blessings, wisdom, and powers. So um, when you hear the word demon in, uh, in the culture that I'm familiar with, ordinary mainstream middle American, middle Australian culture, demons are, that's a, a word with a lot of taboo on it. You don't, uh, ghost would be another one, but demons in particular, we don't talk about them much. And I know there are folks who, when, uh, when they hear the word demon, the first thought is the movie um, Senior's Moment, just skipped out, not possessed, not, uh, if they just had an anniversary of the film. Um, so there's a, not possessed, not bewitched, what's it called? The, the, the um, ah, they're beginning to laugh at me. They're shouting at their, their computer. Dharma Master, it's called the, um, yeah, yeah, where you, the, it's the Catholic priest is called upon the young to chase the demon away from the little girl, and the little girl's head revolves as if she had no bones in her neck, and she vomits out. It'll come to me. Um, <laughs> The thoughts, yeah, no, hold on there. So, you know what I'm talking about. There is that famous film. And they, uh, it's scary film. It is, it was a landmark film. And the, uh, that's pretty much as close as we get to demons. Here in Buddhist sutras, demons are very much, a part of the landscape the same way I think uh, that if, if we want to no, not the same way I won't try to equate that um, in similar fashion to the devil as Satan who we meet where in the Old Testament in the Bible the biblical Satan who um, if you understand the book of Job, uh, is a contemporary of God and hangs out with God and challenges him. And they converse, they have conversations. The exorcist, that's the word I wanted to pull. Thank you, somebody psychically sent me that word. The movie called The Exorcist, to exorcise a demon. That's kind of as close as we can get to it in popular culture without people kind of looking sideways at you and getting a little further away from you. You start talking about demons, it's bad business. You go directly for uh, the people in the white coats to come and sedate you, right? So in the Buddhas, in the sutras, not so much. Why? Because the Buddha transcends the realm of demons and can draw a circle around it. In our founding story, the founding story of the Dharma, of Buddhas, of the Buddha, under the Bodhi tree, um, the, the Mara, M-A-R-A, which means killer in Sanskrit, Mara is the demon king, is very concerned, personally concerned, that this pesky, troublesome, persistent Indian prince has been getting closer and closer to enlightenment 
And that's a direct threat to Mara's power. And so as the prince, Siddhartha, is there just about to get enlightened, the, the demon king sends his daughters to seduce him, fails, sends his armies to conquer him, fails, and then personally shows up and tries to lie to the Buddha that he's never going to get enlightened and he should quit and pr says, challenges the, the prince and says, who, sort of, who says you're going to wake up? Who is witness to your enlightenment? And the Buddha says, the earth is my witness, touches the earth. You've seen images of the Buddha in full lotus touching the earth. That's it. At that point, Mara's done. The Buddha uh, officially escapes the, the realm of Mara. Uh, so from that perspective, from that viewpoint, the Buddha then goes on to teach and says, oh my goodness, there's lots of demonology in the Chinese Mahayana tradition that we can talk about that, that is passed on, this kind of learning, this lore. And it says that we in our human realm, if you look at what are called the ten Dharma realms, there are four realms that are beyond birth and death. They're already into stages of awakening, of nirvana. There are arhats who have put an end to the birth and death of the body. There are pracheka buddhas who are uh, further along into their minds. There are bodhisattvas who choose to remain in samsara. And there are buddhas who have completely uh, ceased. They, their state of nirvana is anuttara samyak sambodhi. Um, there's no further, nothing left to wake up. They're completely awake, 100%. Bodhisattvas keep a little bit of, of ignorance so that they can relate to living beings. Prachekas and arhats um, have a great deal, comparatively, of their nature that, is, that hasn't been awakened. So that's the four, right? I said 10 Dharma realms, four of those. Six Dharma realms, the one that we're looking at is the heavens and the humans. It's said that in the, in the realm, there's a place where the realm of humans and the realm of devas meet and overlap. If I had a, an image, I could draw it for you. So I don't, uh, I'm not going to do that here. So the realm of humans, if we look at the, uh, let's, I'm going to revise that. Let's just look at the realm of the devas. So in the Deva's realm, where the gods live, there are three different levels of heavens, the way the Buddha described it, having now transcended. And he said, there are six desire realm heavens. That's one level of heavens. There's 28 levels of what are called the Brahma realm, form realm heavens. On top of that, there are four realms of formlessness, gods who have go beyond bodies. All right, so far so good. Did I lose anybody at this point? So here we are in the realm of gods. The Buddha says, right, six, 28, and four. Those are the, those are the devas realms, not just one heaven somehow, the way I, was, I heard it growing up as a Methodist. So those first six, so, there's the realm of humans. Above us, there are four deva kings. Above them, there's the heaven of the 33 gods. Above them, there's the Suyama heaven. Above them is the Tushita heaven. Above them is the heaven of uh, bliss, Huala, bliss by transformation. And above them is the heaven of bliss derived from others, transformations. Why am I telling you this? It's because right at that point is where the demon king lives. Mara lives above the desire realm. He is the boss of the desire realm. 
this, I'm giving you, now this is not my own experience, I'm reading you from the, the guidebook to Buddhist cosmology as given to us by the Buddha. So the idea is anybody who is in the desire realm heavens, six, five, four, three, two, one, and on down, human realm, Ashura realm, animals, ghosts, and hell beings are all under the control of the demon king. The demon is the boss uh, of all those realms and has uh, his, he makes his living by, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to talk politics, by starting wars, uh, by increasing people's desire and greed and keeping us uh, under his sway. Should we desire to break free from Mara, there is a way, according to the Buddha's teaching, and that way is to go beyond the desire realm heavens, go to the form realm. How do you do that? Samadhi. Rudin, enter Samadhi. Cultivate the dhyanas. Chu chan, ar chan, san chan, si chan. First, second, third, and fourth levels of dhyanas. When we can enter the dhyanas through our meditation, we reach the form realm beyond Mara's power to shake us. So, my goodness, how interesting. And so, in other words, you can be a deva, you can be a god in heaven and have all those incredible blessings and still you can be hooked by desire into Mara's control. And that's how what Mara uses is desire. It gives you things you want. You think they're outside, oh, I want that, go out for it. Oh, guess what? It was a manifestation of your own nature and you're hooked. If we can, while well, in meditation, take eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, and put them into that synthesis and harmony of mm, samadhi, that vibration level of purity, and not be hooked out by anything we see or hear or think, smell or taste or touch, then there's a transformation. Mara can't move us by desire. Now, that's okay. So this is like one aspect of desire, of demonology, you could say, in Buddhism. So think about that. It means that meditation, progress in meditation, requires an awareness of a whole another pantheon populated by beings with wholesome intent and unwholesome intent. You have to be savvy to meditate at a certain point. Another aspect of it, deeper, deeper than the four dhyanas, is the Buddhist teaching in the Sharangama Sutra. The entire last chapter goes, say the Buddha was talking to Ananda about all the topics that come up in the Sharangama Samadhi and all of the, the that that whole body of information and he was about to leave and then he sat back down on his dharma seat and said you know what there's more actually i'm not done the the progress that you might make in meditation having heard what i just taught you needs another level of awareness which is the teaching on the skanda demons. Hmm. So he proceeds to explain 50 different states that can happen as one meditates. And if you want to go to Buddhahood, you need to thread your way through and overcome all those different states. How interesting, right? So fundamentally, they there are a number of demons that the Buddha teaches about. There's the demon of sickness, which will stop all progress towards wholesome pursuits because you're sick, you're lying down, you're miserable. 
COVID, COVID can just knock you down, right? You, uh, temperature is up, you're dizzy, you have headaches, your body aches. So that's a demon, a demon of sickness, metaphorically speaking. There is the demon of afflictions, which greed, anger, delusion, pride, and doubt, they will definitely kill your body resolve. If uh, you think you want to cultivate, but then uh, I'm not, I'd rather actually go hang out with my buddies at the bar, go bowling. Rather go overthrow the government at the Capitol. Stage an insurrection. Why not? So that's an affliction. That's unhealthy. That's not progress towards clarity and understanding and compassion. So that's an affliction. It's called a demon, the demon of afflictions. So we have the bing mo, we have the fan nao mo, right? Two kinds. There is si mo, there's the demon of death. Metaphorically speaking, death is called a demon in the same way because it stops your progress until you come back, until we come back in a new body, go through all the hassle of childhood, adolescence, and meeting a teacher, and putting aside worldly things, and learning new perspectives, new priorities, and picking up the Dharma and cultivating. That's a long process. We do it ideally, hopefully, over and over again. But it's an interruption. You have to go through the womb and come out again. And so the demon of death, Silmo, stops us. And there are Tian Mo, as we mentioned before. Tian Mo. So how many demons do we have? We have the demon of the devas, the demons of the heavens. We have the demon of illness, the demon of affliction, the demon of death. So the Tianmo, we hear about the Tianmo Wai Dao, right? Um, the gods and the heterodox cultivators, that's our phrase in our sutra here. So the idea is that if um, we, we want to give a body to a demon, illness doesn't have a body, afflictions doesn't, don't have bodies, Death doesn't have, it's the absence, it's the, the ending of one body and the getting of another. When you get to the Tianmo, the, the, de, the demons of the heavens, in fact, they're embodied. They, that's Satan that we mentioned. That's Mara who comes to the Buddha. Now, this is fascinating, and I don't, I'm sure it's been done, uh, but I've encouraged graduate students to Maybe it's not you shouldn't encourage because it's you have to have, be, have a lot of samadhi to even deal with demonology without getting depressed, without getting yin and dark. So I've often thought how interesting that in the Buddha's description of how where Mara interacts with humans, Mara is at the above the the desire heaven called uh, Tahua Zazatian, the bliss or happiness derived from others' transformations. That's the parinamana vashavartin level of the heavens. Tahua zidaitin. That's where Mara lives. And so he's up above the desire realm. Okay? That's the way the Buddha describes it. What about Hebrew scriptures? Hmm. Satan is in the same place, up in the heavens talking to the Buddha. And then Satan is cast down and falls. But how interesting that these two ancient systems of thought both posit the king of demons up in the heavens. We usually think, oh, the devil should be down in the hells. Well, he's up in the heavens as the stories begin. All right, so we've got how many demons? We've got the demon of the heavens, Tian Mo, we've got the demon of illness, Bing Mo, we have the demon of afflictions, Fan Na Mo, we have the demon of death, Si Mo, what else? We have the demon of Zi Xing, self nature, your own nature, your inherent nature demons. What is that? 50 skanda demons. Mm. They're there waiting to be encountered 
transformed and subdued, harmonized. And the Buddha describes that group of demons in the Sharangama Sutra teachings. Huh. So the idea is that as we meditate and heat suffuses the body from our intense meditation, the samadhis, and that there are transformations of the elements of the body and the inner three treasures, the Jing, Qi, and Shen. And with each, and so you're sitting there and you realize that your physical form, the, the earth, air, fire, and water of the body are transforming. They start to buzz. There's heat. There's an energy. They expand. They contract. They get cold. All these things happen. Master Hua would say, these are all Jing Jie. These are all just states of being that are temporary. Don't get confused by them. Don't be afraid of them and don't be proud of them either. Don't say, oh, I must be close to enlightenment now. Things are happening. He said, just go through it and get up for lunch as always. You know, get up when the phone rings and you have to go to the bathroom and otherwise sit like a rock, meditate like a bell. So um, as those transformations happen, things, there are st states of mind that accompany them. Each of the five skandhas, the five heaps, has 10 different states, altogether 50. And when you get up to the skanda of formations and consciousness, those states are incredibly sublime and wonderful and inconceivably vast states where you see worlds coming into being and, and falling apart and you see the secrets of the universe and every single one of those 50, the Buddha says, now, when this state occurs, it is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, you could say it's essential unless you interpret it as sagehood. Do not assume when these states occur that you are enlightened or a sage. If you can remain unmoved when these states occur, recognize them for what they are, there is no harm. You pass through them to the next set of 10 or in within each 10 set of 10. When you get all the way through, you're a Buddha. So he says, do not... Uh, once you can see that this is just a state, you're fine. You did it. You passed through. So those are, that's number five kinds of demons, the Xingmo, demons of your inherent nature. So how interesting, right? Here's the Buddha giving us this incredibly technical breakdown of what you might call yin energies in the universe and inside us, externally and internally. Um, this is teaching we can use on the path to awakening. And when you get this kind of like careful guidance through the canyons and valleys of your own mind, you think, how can people be satisfied with the teaching that says, let go and let God? God will do it for you? What about when the demons of illness come? What about when, you know, and so forth. So, this is profound, deep insight into the realities of purifying the mind and nature. And Shurful gives you a verse, too. Master Hua said, okay. He said, in fact, look at it this way. Just from the Buddha's own story, from Shakyamuni Buddha's story, you realize that demons are essential to progress in the way. That the Buddha could not have gotten enlightened without the help of the demons. So it's Mo 
真光亮，光亮更摇磨，磨得如秋月。空中照春磨，春磨即退了，现出现出是信佛。Says, demons polish the true path. 磨是磨真的。The true path requires demons. 磨是磨真道，真道才有磨。呃，磨的 ，the more they rub, the brighter you get. You get rubbed and polished by the demons to the point where you shine like the October moon in the empty sky. When the hordes of demons are illuminated. By the light of your self nature, then the Buddha of your inherent nature appears. So that idea is that、um, through the adversity of demons, that that old phrase, "Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger," is true. The idea is that when things go against us, ni jing. Adverse states、uh, occur if we can recognize them and use the Buddha's、uh, high-level, you know, perspective, seeing from outside the state, borrowing his vision. You realize, yeah, things that go wrong are actually there to help me、uh, fortify my bodhi resolve and to reapply myself with patience and vigor to my practices, and that way. The the demons become your good and wise advisors from the reverse. When things are smooth and easy and everything's going your way, that's not necessarily the best state. It's very easy to get stuck because it reinforces this idea of me and mine, myself, which is not your best friend, not our best friend in cultivation. So, mo shi mo zhen dao, demons polish the true path. Right, so lots of good teachings here about demonology. It's not simply the exorcist. I'm embarrassed that I couldn't come up with that name for so long. That incredible movie that was what was it 50 years ago? The Exorcist came out, and when we hear demons, we just blah, 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 you know run the other way. Well, from the point of view of cultivation, from the Buddha Dharma, demons are an essential part of the process. But we have to know. About them,、um, <laughs> I told the story before. He had a an old Dharma friend from Taipei come visit Berkeley Monastery, and he was an old timer. He was a, a, whenever Shufu went to Taiwan, this old guy would show up, and Shufu would laugh with him and tell stories. And he was the old school. He came to the Berkeley Monastery for the first time in his last few years, and he saw that we were meditating, and we had in the Buddha Hall we had women on one side and men on the other side. And he said, "Oh no 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 no!" He says, "You can't let women meditate." He says, "If you let women meditate, he says, you just catch a demon. You'll catch a demon." He said,、and、we're like.、Uh, This is Berkeley, California. Do you know where you are? You sure? You do, maybe you shouldn't think that way. Yes, women meditate. Yes, they do, and they can get enlightened as well.、And、they can teach you how to get enlightened. So it was like his old school. What do you say? Zuo huo, zuo huo ru mo, zuo huo ru mo. That's the phrase that that he used. He said to walk in the fire and catch a demon. And it's like, yeah, it's no wonder that Buddha Dharma is struggling in the West. <laughs> so proper Dharma in the world,、uh, with those views that gender has to do with catching a demon, is profoundly unaware of the reality of the Buddha nature, which is neither male nor female, but does contain yin. Energies that, when subdued, help you wake up, go all the way to Buddhahood, and the Buddha said, "Here's how."
and the uh, his attitude, that old gentleman's attitude, says a lot about why Pure Land practice in Buddhist Asia is the popular way to go, reciting the Buddha's name, not Chan, not meditation. Meditation has caught on again in Buddhist Asia only after coming to the West and people picking up mindfulness and meditation as a necessary part of our daily lives because of the pace of life and of the uh, afflictions that arise from uh, the, the speed with which we consume our planet, right? So people are meditating more because we need it. We need it to counter the, the blistering, crazy pace of life. So, right, uh, his world, you recite the Buddha's name, that's all you do. You don't meditate. No thanks. No, nope. we in fact meditate. So, a bit about demons. Just We've only touched one line of sutra, but I wanted to go into it to say, at times they use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras, that many, to show how to tame the demonic hordes. Lots of challenges to meditation. Subdue their why, thou, heterodox ways, ways that lead outside only, and will always frustrate you because there's nothing outside to get. And reveal the bodhisattva's blessings, wisdoms, and powers. Cool. Next, number two. Look at this one. Two today. Huo xian bu ke shuo fo cha wei chen shu. That's the same line as in every case. Zhi yi qie gong qiao, ming zhi men. Okay, these are called, from here on, these are ming zhi men, ming zhi men. Lit, bright, illuminated, clear, wisdom, gateways, methods, techniques. So, know all skill, craft, bright, knowledge, gateway. Put that together. At times they use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras to demonstrate clear knowledge and proficiency in arts and skills. Hmm. Hmm. Arts and skills. Let's see, what could that be? Going to take you once again. I told you we were going <laughs> to... We're, today we're doing the deep dive here. Um, here we are. Okay, let me describe it first and I'll show you. Now, um, there is in the, I believe it's the 10 stages chapter, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Shudipin, the 10 grounds. When the Bodhisattva gets to number five, fifth stage, um, number five among the paramitas, as we learned last week, always has to do with meditation with dhyana, chan, chan bolomi, dhyana paramita, which is meditation. And it's samadhi, it's what happens to your mind as you uh, develop meditative skill, mind and body. So um, as the chapter goes in the fifth stage, the fifth ground, our bodhisattva is a good meditator, samadhi ensues. And now that the Bodhisattva's mind doesn't move anymore, it's fascinating because the Sutra says he or she um, now enters the neighborhood with the talents of the Gong Chao, uh, um, with the talents of the Wu Ming Xue, the five fold sciences. That's kind of our best translation. We used to say the five bright studies. That's pure Chinglish. The five bright studies. No. We say the five fold curriculum uh, or the five clear knowledges sometimes. Wu Ming Xie. What are they? Let's take a look. Uh, let me, one more, one more. 
The idea is that here in the fifth stage of the Bodhisattva's development, because his or her mind is able to focus on a single point and not be confused by anything beyond the practices, at this, to one through four, the Bodhisattva has had to stick with the practice and be very careful what their senses are exposed to for fear that they will scatter. Once you get to stage five, you're solid. You're, you don't move. They say, ru ru bu dong, liao liao chang ming. Thus, in a state of thusness, unmoving constantly bright and resolved. So at that point, you can touch worldly things without being confused by them or without being made to fall back, to lose your resolve to cultivate. What does the Bodhisattva do then? The Sutra says, he picks up, she picks up the five fold sciences, the five curriculums. And in a way, you could say it goes back to school, not just to expand knowledge. Knowledge is not the point anymore for the Bodhisattva. It's saving people from confusion is the point for the Bodhisattva. So this Bodhisattva now can branch out and learn a, a widespread uh, variety of worldly knowledge so that he or she can teach. What would those be? What are the five-fold sciences? Take a look. This is so interesting because it's a traditional world's school curriculum. Ancient India defined an educated person, ancient Indian definition of an educated person had uh, let's see, one who has command of the fivefold sciences. What are the fivefold sciences? They're called the Wu, Ming, Xue. Here we are. First is Yin, Ming. Second is Nei, Ming. Third is Sheng, Ming. Fourth is Yi, Ming. And the fifth is, there's our words we just saw in the sutra, Gong, Xiao, Ming. What are they? Yin, Ming is... Buddha Dharma, cause and effect, Yin Ming. Uh, take it, uh, translate it. Oh, there we go. I've got them backwards. No, I had it right. Okay, there we go. We'll put that here and get this. So you can see it neatly. One more. Okay. This one goes here. Okay. First one. Yin Ming. What is Yin Ming? It is causality. In other words, cause and effect. In other words, Dharma. So if you are a young, bright mind, capable of learning, interested in wisdom, okay, say, there we go, uh, ready to learn, fascinated by the world around you, your elders would teach you Yin Ming. They would say, okay, here's cause, here's effect. This is a law of the universe. This is how things work. So understand this. This is the foundation of your future knowledge. All other knowledge is based on this foundation. It grows from it. Number two, they say, you know what else you need? You need to understand how knowledge itself works. Nay, meaning internal systems. How you, so this would be where you'd learn about body, uh, the skandhas, right? Body, emotion, sensation. You'd learn about 
the mind thinking you learn about metabolism sleep cycles digestion you'd learn about consciousness in that class epistemology how you know things that's the second thing that children learn third look at this one sheng sound so sound science shabda sheng ming what did you learn in sheng ming literature language poetry music letters arts of all kinds how you communicate that's an important class in the training of a young mind so you've got dharma the fundamental dharma cause and effect you've got internal systems how we learn what we're made of humans how we communicate as humans number 4 e ming is when humans get sick and it's medical science typically in india it would be ayurveda in china of course it would be uh if they adopt the system it would be uh you know zhong yi all the different five elements etc so when you break down yi ming it includes interestingly possession mental illness uh it includes um things that we would call psychosis neurosis paranoia schizophrenia that um medical science so healing body mind and spirit uh and based on post diagnosis and curing largely with food interestingly all right the last one number 5 is our key to today's text it says the bodhisattva what did what did the bodhisattva do at times they use methods equal in number to dust particles in an ethical buddhic shastra to demonstrate clear knowledge and proficiency in arts and skills okay so here we have a bodhisattva who wants to teach living beings and he's working with a community of crafts people the bodhisattva here in the sutra this is the 10 10 grounds remember in the fifth stage is the fifth ground the bodhisattva investigates the wu ming shi the five sciences and it says here the bodhisattva becomes an expert at gemology working with precious stones becomes a jeweler the bodhisattva becomes a cook a wonderful chef the bodhisattva is skilled in farming he knows exactly how to bring food out of the ground the right season the right amount of moisture how to work with this with the the weather the bodhisattva is very good uh, with animals horses uh chickens right fish the bodhisattva knows how to deal with cockatoos and parrots and crows and insects and spiders and snakes and sea creatures the bodhisattva is skillful with all of these and uses this knowledge to teach living beings furthermore the bodhisattva is skilled with music the creation of musical instruments so that he can uh delight uh living beings make them happy with rhythm with melody with singing choir with voice so that uh he can <coughs> use these abilities to teach living beings so look at this this is so wonderful when the bodhisattva has samadhi and doesn't move in his or her mind he or she is able to bring up the five fold sciences and as necessary teach living beings particularly this last one so the bodhisattva is really good at fixing lawn mowers the bodhisattva is really good at painting houses the bodhisattva is really good at uh designing landscape architecture so that when it rains the water goes around the buildings and doesn't go under the buildings and flood them right 
those kind of skills, architecture and commerce, all these things the Bodhisattva is good at. So the, after I read that, it was so liberating to realize that uh, monks didn't, at monks at a certain point are able to leave the safe, comfy monastery and go out in the world and talk to people because why? He or she has got to teach them. And this is how. This is how. You can't only sit back and say, I am pure. Don't bother me with your petty problems of the world. That's nothing but dust. Right? No. You, if you're, all you know is to be pure, nobody needs to listen to what you say. Then you go be pure. Meanwhile, I have a real world problem. The Bodhisattva gets in there and says, let me use what I know. I can maybe teach you, you can teach me, together we'll solve the problem using these wonderful skills. All right, I was really thrilled to see this and, and realize that the um, Avatamsaka in giving us a fifth stage bodhisattva who is good at the fivefold sciences um, is actually giving us the basis for education. This is an education curriculum that if we can interpret and in, integrate this into uh, the, the things that Dharma and Buddhist University wants to teach, that we could make the sutra come alive and bring the wisdom of the ancients to a modern world. When I talk about this, uh, people said, oh, you know, Confucius, Confucius too. Confucius had not the Wu Ming, he had the Liu Yi. Oh, yes, in fact, he did. In the Confucian world, education was based upon what were called the six arts. This was the curriculum model for standard educating people. The first was rights, Li Yi. Rights means more than just a ceremony. It means how you behave in any circumstance. So face to face with elders, you know exactly what kind of verb form to use so that you address them properly with respect. Uh, when someone dies, you know exactly how to uh, conduct yourself at the funeral to be in harmony so that you can work with people and uh, heal their hearts. That's rights. It's, it's operating in a human realm smoothly without friction, without stumbling, without causing trouble. That's education. That's what it's for. Someone who knows that, has that knowledge, is always welcome, is someone upon whom others can rely. Right. Next, music. So, interesting. Confucius himself played the guqin. It's documented. He walked around with a five-string, not a seven-string, but a five-string guqin, and would play music inspired by nature and uh, passed it on. How wonderful. Music, according to Confucius, was essential for calming our wild human nature, that when you play music skillfully, people can wake up. Now, look at this one, archery. What was archery? Archery would be sports, phys ed. Um, archery is, of course, a universal, uh, usually military discipline. Shooting arrows is a weapon, but Archery for Confucius, which went on in Japan to become Zen archery, is there again to teach body and mind uh, how to focus and to bring all of your senses to a single point. Um, we have uh, our Dharma brother Ben here, whose son, Daniel, uh, recently came back from Japan and what was Daniel doing in Japan? He was studying Zen archery, which is very much alive in Japan to this day. It's one of the related Zen arts. And Daniel tells a story. He says, 
Oh yeah, he says we uh, the the dojo, the the hall where I studied, has as its uh, senior teacher uh, this master, and he said it's funny uh, in the Zen archery that that I learned, hitting the target is not important. It's not really that important. The important part is how you bring your bow, you turn it, form you employ, getting getting to the bow, these giant bows that they use and how hard they are to pull. And the everything about the process of shooting arrows is part of Zen archery, not whether or not you hit the target. When all of this is done right, you will hit the target, he said, without even trying. He said, our grandmaster is famous because he comes out and turn, they turn the lights off in the, in the zendo where the arrows are shot. And you hear the bow stretch, you hear thuk, you hear the bow stretch, thrum, you hear the bow stretch, thrum. They turn the lights on and three arrows within a 10 cent piece in the center of the target. The, the Zen master was able to hit the, a dime with three arrows in the dark, right? And he says, yeah, yeah, that's concentration. He's good at that. <laughs> so phys ed, what's number four? Charioteering. What would charioteering be? Driver's ed. So the ability to handle what? Horses, carriages, all of the different skills that you learn by making a wheel. Let's make a wheel for a cart. Ooh, you better learn mathematics so you can measure a perfectly round wheel based on spokes and how you're going to hold it together. So charioteering would involve everything that puts a cart together, all the different skills involved, carpentry skills. So, and then horses, how to drive back in the day. Now, we would, what would we do? Learn how to repair a, an engine. We develop electro, electric vehicles, probably battery technology, right? So, yeah, can you make a battery out of salt water? We've got a lot of salt water. Maybe you can, so you don't have to depend upon rare earths from war zones. Charioteering. What about calligraphy? Oh my goodness. Calligraphy, of course, would be the gateway into language, literature. Calligraphy for, in the Chinese world, among the six arts, is kind of scary. I, uh, I am a believer that a skillful calligrapher can look at your brush calligraphy and know pretty much everything about you the way an astrologer can look at a horoscope and know a lot about your character. Chinese, Chinese brush writers, Chinese calligraphers, look at your calligraphy and they go, Whoa, wow, this person, and they know. Master Hua told me, he said, now you can practice brush calligraphy, but don't show your characters to anyone. He said, once they take a look at your Chinese calligraphy, he said, they lose all respect for you. Oh, it's just a kid, third grader. So, so I, I don't show anybody, even at the blackboard. He told me, when you go to the blackboard, write ABCs. And then uh, once I got to uh, Gold Buddha Monastery in 1980, uh, a package arrived from Gold Mountain, and it was books on Western calligraphy, italic handwriting. He said, your handwriting is a mess. Your English handwriting is a mess. Just straighten it up. So I did. I learned after lunch, I would study calligraphy, had a beautiful book that taught me how to do italic. So, but brush calligraphy, that's something else. Ooh, soft pen, wet ink. Oh my goodness. It just shows everything about who you are. So I believe that the Chinese can tell much about your character by looking at your handwriting with a brush. Finally, mathematics. Mathematics was its own discipline. Chinese mathematics was so incredible that they predicted eclipses with incredible accuracy. You look back uh, now, current astronomers look at the charts left behind from the Qin Dynasty, and they go, "Yeah, this is." They knew exactly when eclipses were going to happen, 
and the movement of the stars and the planets because Chinese mathematics was so incredible. So now China has a space program. <laughs> They're landing spacecraft on the moon. That is not a new thing. They've Chinese science led the world for centuries and centuries and centuries. So do not look lightly on what the six arts can produce. So six arts, fivefold sciences, this is a, uh, these are disciplines, save that, disciplines that have been in the world for a very long time, um, forming the basis of education for people. And our bodhisattva, what does the bodhisattva do? The bodhisattva uses methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras to demonstrate clear knowledge and proficiency in arts and skills. Oh, yes, he does. What else? Methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras to demonstrate clear knowledge of all the differences among living beings. And he's able to come up with a method to teach all those differences. To demonstrate clear knowledge of the distinctions between all dharmas. And how they can be learned and taught. What would be a distinction between all dharmas? Mm, what's the... Uh, the If you know the di distinctions between all dharmas, you can live in a way that, for example... Um, how to live in a dry climate, um, houses below the ground. What if in, as the earth becomes desertified, more desert as we dry out, um, we're going to have to start exploring underground living so that uh, when the temperature climbs into the 110s and 120s, we can still survive. People have done it. We know how to do it. You have to start with learning the distinctions between all dharmas. Demonstrating clear knowledge of what beings' minds delight in. Um, there's a, an idiom in the Chinese Mahayana that says, if you uh, want to entice people into the dharma, give them something good to eat. <laughs> That's the way to bring them in. You betcha. Yeah, so, vegetarian feast. To demonstrate clear knowledge of all beings, roots, practices, afflictions, and habits. This sounds a lot like the Bodhisattva's powers, doesn't it? The ten powers, where you know how people's minds work, you know how to teach them. At times, they use methods equal in number to demonstrate clear knowledge of beings' manifold karma. If you know what, where people have been, you know how they're going to repeat their habits. Karma is just habitual action and the results of it. To demonstrate equal the number in an effable Buddha Kshetras to show how to enlighten all beings. Last sentence. Yi ru shi deng bu ke shuo fu cha wei chen shu fang bian man. Wang yi yi che zhong sheng zhu chu er cheng shou zhi. Using the above skillful means, equal the number of dust particles in ineffable bodhisattvas, those bodhisattvas traveled to where beings lived and brought them to maturity. They did. That's the point. So, now, we're going to learn next week that as these bodhisattvas uh, use these 25 different skills and go to where living beings are in order to teach them, you know what else? They don't leave the Jade Grove as they do this. Oh, excuse me, didn't you just contradict yourself? Nope, nope. That's the wonderful power of these bodhisattvas, that they can do all of this from bodies that I don't possess because I'm locked into this bag of skin, the Chopinang that the Buddha described. So bodhisattvas are not. They are able to use what are called huasheng to go out and do all this incredible teaching. And yet, as I, you know, you want to take it from me? Uh, am I a reliable witness? These 
all of these abilities are present in each of us. We have these skills. We just were so involved in success, trying so hard to make it pay that we run right past these incredible abilities. So, um, I wanted to let folks know, I'm going to go here, G, C, D, R, there we go. I'm going out to our Gold Coast Dharma realm. Oops, you know what? It's not there. Oh, all right. Okay, I won't do that today. Um, I was going to say, we're doing a uh, Guan Yin Bodhisattva session here. And uh, there's a way to tune in online, but at the moment it's not available. So that people can, uh, it's ideally if you're in the time zone, if you're in the Northwest, uh, if you're in America, North America, that's, you're going to have to follow us at midnight if you want to see it or 2 a.m. So not so clean. City of 10,000 Buddhas, uh, has a Guan Yin session, and you can tune in there, CTDB Live. Alrighty, uh, let's see, what can I share? I can share with you something amazing. Well, there's a, mm, there's some somebody amazing. Take a look here. This is a, a scene from the rain. We had rain the other day, and the, there we go. And all the birds came and found shelter under my roof. Here's what it looked like. 33 cockatoos. I'm behind the screen door. The screen door. Oh, there's the screen door. That's a lot of hungry birds. You say, why was I behind the screen door? It's because when I come out with that many birds, they're super, super hungry, and they just, they just want to know where's the bird seed, monk. So I put it out bit by bit and give everybody a little bit. And then they fly away and the ones who are left get more. So how wonderful to be, uh, to operate a bird cafe here in the Gold Coast. Um, I uh, get to speak the Dharma for them, recite the Buddha's name and the seven Tathagata's names. I do that a lot. Okay, time to dedicate merit. The, uh, we will not, that the Berkeley Monastery will be not back to regular Dharma assemblies until November. So, coming up, be patient. Meanwhile, let's dedicate merit. Send it out. Send out your goodness everywhere in the world that can use uh, an infusion of joy, of stability, of courage and fearlessness. It's a frightening time in the world right now, and uh, there we go. People who can send out happiness and that sense of samadhi and stability and self-sufficiency, that's what we need the most, because from there comes compassion and kindness. So let's do it. Here we go. Please make a wish.
unity made our minds away to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. We can bow to the Buddhas if you want to join me. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. That's going to do it for us for today. That's our lecture. Look forward to seeing you all next week. Please be kind to our fellow travelers. That's what counts in the end. Amitofo. Bye now, everybody. Recording.